100 feet. Okay. And I def defined two different ones in their sequence. Oh, I forgot to show you one more thing. Uh, on this, and that is that I, I, in the, in the, I set the source definition in front of the driven element, and here I'm saying, here is a transmission line link, source equals one, and that means take where the source was defined and move it to the end of this piece of collapse, and it's showing 1.1 dB of loss. So the difference between what RG8X and LOR uh, 400 is eight tenths of a dB loss. For how, and how many dollars? For <laughs> how, how many dollars per dB? How much? How many dollars per dB is that? Yeah. Okay. See, for that's the power, kind of the power that you can do uh, what? with this. Uh, these are uh, some advertisements here, like I said, this is uh, that detector that was in the prior slide. This is a uh, JH Bunnell. Uh, disappeared in a radio catalog uh, very early on, but it shows a variable capacitor, which again we uh, been recently introduced around 1907 uh, by Marconi. The adjustable detector there, some of the other equipment you can get, uh, storage batteries to run your equipment, detectors, headphones. Uh, and this is a picture here of the Electro Importing Company. Uh, they were shot in New York. They were one of the first companies that offered a, a whole range of radio equipment or wireless equipment. You could pay through their catalog and order things out of there and make yourself at the time a pretty advanced radio set. Uh, these are examples here of some early wireless stations, uh, again around the same time, 1910, 1915 uh, time. And you can see they, they're starting to use tuning coils now. Spark at down on the top here, there's an antenna switch, change to <coughs> transmit to receive, a uh, small spark coil. Uh, and this young person here is operating a set on some dry cell batteries, you can see. And that was pretty much the early days. It was really the wild west of, uh, of radio. Uh, but you can see they have some pretty advanced commercial equipment here. Uh, this is an early uh, loose coil receiver that was used by the Navy. Uh, on a lot of their ship stations, and they're probably using a quench spark system, which was a, a slightly more advanced spark gap. Uh, and everything was still pretty chaotic until 1912. We all know what happened in 1912. Okay. Titanic hits an iceberg and sinks. Uh, it was one of the uh, uh, first ships to use the new signal SOS. Uh, in sending out a distress call. At the time, it had one of the most powerful wireless uh, sets afloat. It had a five kilowatt Marconi uh, synchronous rotary spark gap. It sent out a very musical 500 hertz uh, tone. Uh, and what happened after the Titanic sank, as the rescue ship, the Carpathia, who picked up the roughly 700 survivors of the Titanic, uh, once it was steaming back to New York with those passengers on board, they were sending out the lists of those that had been saved and those that had perished. Uh, and the operators on board the ship, well, the single operator on the uh, Carpathia worked around the clock, uh, aided by the other surviving operator from the Titanic, uh, to send out these messages. And once they got within earshot of the uh, hands within on the eastern seaboard, they were sending these messages back and forth. And a lot of the newspapers went to these young people and said, hey, you have a wireless set. Can you listen in and get those messages for us so we can publish them in the morning's paper? And a lot of the issues that sprang from this were the amateur operators, uh, many of them were uh, telegraph operators, landline telegraph operators, who were using uh, a different sort of Morse code, the original landline code, which is slightly different than today's international code, if you learn that. Uh, so the American code has dots, dashes, and spaces in it. Today's code, the international code, only has dots and dashes. And if you come to my talk tomorrow, I will tell you differences between the codes and why the two codes exist. Uh, but regardless, they're using a slightly different code, so some of the letters they picked up were a little bit different. So some of the names were incorrectly reported to the press. And this caused pandemonium, public pandemonium, that many people thought their loved ones had been saved, and it turned out that they weren't. Uh, that and controlling the information uh, to and from the press. 
So following the Titanic disaster, besides that, you had all that interference that I talked about, all these hams using their broadband, their spark transmitters. So Congress finally stepped in after the, uh, the sinking of the Titanic and passed a Radio Act of 1912, uh, which ruled that all ham operators would have to have a tuned transmitter and would be relegated to only 200 meters and below, which, as we all know, is probably one of the best things that happened to ham radio. It increased later on research into uh, today what would be considered uh, shortwave frequencies. So it opened up uh, the world of ham radio we know today. The induction coil inside, there's a little spark gap mounted on the top here, a little variable spark gap. Uh, the variable condenser or variable capacitor is two pieces of brass tubing that slide inside of each other uh, to change your capacitance. Uh, the crystal detector, this is a, uh, an iron pyrite detector. It's basically a, a piece of fool's gold uh, with a... Hmm? Whisker? Yes, yeah, so this wire here, this was known as the cat's whisker. Um, that was the nickname given to the little wire that touched the crystal. Uh, and there's a double slide tuning coil here. And inside... ...is a little pair of headphones folded up. So it's basically a complete wireless set in a box here. Alright, welcome. I know that uh, some of you probably were expecting Julie, uh, Kilo 8 Victor Oscar X-Ray, but she was unable to make the event, asked me to take her place. Uh, my name is Justin Sly, Kilo November 4 Mike Quebec Romeo, and I serve as the uh, Parks on the Air mapping representative for the states of Florida and Alaska. And I found out that there were 251 places that I could do Parks on the Air. And so I thought, what better way to test your equipment, durability, to learn how to operate than to go out and try to do all 251 references in one year. And so I, I, that was my challenge, and I did not, uh, and I didn't meet my goal, but I came close. I, I managed to do 233 to the 251, and a lot of the remaining references, a lot of the re remaining references, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, you know, you're starting to need a boat. Uh, there's no roads to these places, so it became very evident that some of these were going to be a little bit more challenging than others. So, you know, with that, um, you know, my game plan today is to talk a little bit uh, about uh, what Parks on the Air is, uh, how to get online, how to register, um, and then really focus some time on uh, references in Florida and some comments related to that. So I think that might be um, appropriate. For trails and rivers, uh, you know, must, you must be within 100 feet. And um, you know, in most cases, that's uh, pretty easy to do. Um, in some cases, and there are places in Florida where, like the Florida Trail, if any of you are familiar, and that's like the over a thousand miles of trails in Florida, uh, they cross over big roads, you know. And at one time, I excavated from underneath the uh, trail, so I thought that was interesting. Um, uh, never trust trespass on private property. That seems obvious, but I just want to reiterate. Um, you know, never trespass on private property you get permission by all means. Um, don't argue with any type of agency staff. That's the key here. Um, even if you have the full right to be there, uh, don't argue. Be kind, courteous, pack your gear up, head out, and maybe we can solve the problem later. Because you don't want to ever mess something up for someone else. And other people want to get out there and activate. Um, so be courteous. And you can only work one reference at a time. This is a little bit different. I wasn't fortunate enough to be involved in the National Parks on the Air program, but there were things called two furs and three furs where you could be in the boundary lines of multiple references and you could submit one law. Uh, so in this case, you need to have um, you know, your contacts for each um, reference. Now, I do love to, to squeeze in a place where there's some overlap. I don't have to break down. I just stop the, the activation and pick up on the, on the next one. So. Um, you must make a minimum of 10 contacts within one Zulu day. Um, and it's important to pay attention to that Zulu day, right? Because, uh, you know, if you get a couple of contacts prior to um, the, the ship and a couple after, um, that add up to over 10, they may both um, not, uh, not count. Um, do your best to try to get a little bit more than 10, 10 QSOs. Um, I've been in that situation where I made a mistake with the call sign and I've had to go back. So. <laughs> um, let's 
Hunters still gain credit uh, if you did make a minimum of 10 uh, QSOs. So if you only made five contacts, go, you know, submit your log. Because if, um, you know, the, the other side, those, those, those people, the less than 10 contacts that you got, they still get credit for hunting you. So um, definitely submit the log. Now, um, again, it, I had mentioned that the Florida Trail um, passes a couple of things, and I'm uh, a couple of roads, and I'm not suggesting this, you know, but um, I know that it does uh, uh, meet the Florida Turnpike uh, uh, twice, at I-10, three times, 75, four separate spots, sometimes when I'm driving, and um, I'll pull off the side of the road if I can get way over, and I'll uh, turn a radio on and see if I can make some contacts. So, um, spotting. Um, you know, this isn't a contest. Uh, soft spot. <laughs> please, please do. Um, it's pretty easy. You, you go to the website and you put your call sign in, your location in the park reference, and away you go. The spot lives for about 20 minutes before it falls off, but nine times out of ten, people are going to come back to you in piles, and they're going to continue to respot for you so that you don't. And that's the idea. Usually the hunters are very accommodating. I mean, you're the one going out into a park, so they're willing to do the extra effort to go on and spot you. A lot of people use Facebook. I'm not a huge Facebook fan, but this is a closed group, which means that um, when you're a member of it, you only interact with the people in the group. Um, no one outside of that can, can see it. Um, people like to, to post where they're going and then provide some feedback. You know, and it's great because sometimes I'll get, I'll have a high noise floor, and um, I'll be able to ask, hey, you know, is there someone else I'm, I'm, I'm stepping on? And they'll be able to say, well, there's a net, a couple of um, K above or, or whatnot. And so it's a, it's a useful tool. And then after action reports, I, I really love these pictures, a uh, map of where the contacts, uh, uh, it's great to see these types of things, especially if you're doing research about a park you want to go to. Uh, you go to the Facebook group and, and do a search in the group for the park you're going to, and a lot of times you'll find something like this, and you can contact them and say, hey, where's a good place to set up? By boat. Um, in other cases, the, uh, the area between the uh, low and high tide mark on the beach, it's public, typically, so. Um, your mileage may vary. Now, if you do find a situation where you absolutely can't go, uh, you report it to the administrator and um, they look at taking them off. I did have one taken off in the panhandle. The land got sold uh, and it was still in the system. So. You know, I looked at some other programs like uh, Summits on the Air. And, you know, I can't do Summits on the Air in Florida. <laughs> so, I would love to. Uh, I would love to, but. Um, uh, none, uh, no area is applicable. So I really like their level of difficulty. Now this isn't an official POTA thing, this is just my personal opinion, and, and I know that they are going to add the ability to add comments um, to, to the references in the future, and I figure, well, I'll just go ahead and upload those comments when that happens. So, you know, based on my experience from those parks, I kind of gave each park a level of difficulty, you know. Um, level one would be like most of your state parks, paved roads, good restroom facilities, on-site staff, you know, a commissary, you could probably even plug into their electricity and not even have to have battery. And level two would be most of your state forests, you know, they're improved dirt roads, you don't need a four by four, no restroom facilities, I mean, there are some, but you might want, not want to use them. Um, usually no full-time staff if you have any questions. And then level three, I, I thought, I mean, those you need four by fours, just a couple places I've, I've had to kick it into four-wheel drive, I've been stuck a few times. Um, <coughs> Some require you to pack gear in. So maybe you have to put it all in a backpack and hike in. Uh, usually for this level, not, not too far. Maybe a permit's required. You know, the gate cut in is an example. Um, and then there's the level four. Sometimes these you can't drive to. Four by four probably definitely required. Long hikes, definitely long hikes. And uh, potentially no land. Yeah, there's a park in the Keys, there's no land. There's just buoys. You know, you can go out there and tie off and so that's, on the list to do so you know based on that i kind of broke it out to get an idea that that really 90 percent of the parks out there are very accessible to anybody um and most activating styles and, and there's about eight percent that are a little harder than that. Uh, it's um uh, adif so you need, you need uh um and it's really the only logging format i'm aware of i think that there was there was a, a post behind the website the file yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the on the website on Parks on the Air, there is a description of the uh, of the of the logging format and the particular fields required. And it's really only your day, um, it's uh, the date, the time, uh, the band, the mode, um, and the call sign, and that's it. And if you had a park to park, the other person's um, park. So it's pretty simple. Is there a way to get the 
share a facility to import a Cabrillo formatted logs from other other uh, events and, and logging programs? Not at this time that I'm aware of. Um, there might be, I think what you'd want to do is look for a logging software that has that capability to import. Um, there's a couple of them that I, that I use on the, the Mac side. I'm, a, I'm an Apple person. Um, it, it's kind of embarrassing, I'll be honest. Um, on, the, um, on, the, on the side of activating, um, I really like to get into like uh, Python programming and whatnot, so I really dug in to try to, to create a, a, a way to spot. So on the spotting side of things, that tells me like how far away people are, which direction they are, what their name is, so I know I had a, a little bit more information than what's currently on the, <coughs> the photo spotter. But on the logging side of things, I use a pencil and paper, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I and you're gonna you're gonna love this, and I use an Excel spreadsheet with macros for my log. But I have a button, I press it, and all of my QRZ information it comes in from grids from all the people, and I have you know seven parks in a day, all the call signs are in there. I press another button, and they all get spit out in the proper ADIF format. With the with the name the parks here, so it's it's the quickest for those um, lithium iron phosphate batteries. I run them dead, and I run them full 100 watts. Um, I fly with those batteries. I hike with the batteries. They are fantastic. So I highly suggest you know taking a look at those and, and giving those up. Well, questions related to batteries or power? Okay. Uh, I think it's a 12. I have two 12 amp, amp hour batteries, and then I have a homemade one I made from uh, uh, Julian White, the YouTube uh, gentleman in. Um, where is he from? Uh, Finland. 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 So he, he creates, so you can buy the cells and make them. And I made one of those. The problem, and I, and I wish I had a picture of it in here, um, I wanted to find something to fly with, and um, the one I made looks like a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to fly with that. I'm not going to fly with that. I do fly with these. Um, 12 amp hour batteries and two of them on my carry-on, um, which is for Delta um, uh, um, domestic flights is, is perfectly fine. The, the, in those days, vacuum tube receiver, and I, so I started then getting interested in listening to find out, you know, how far away can I hear? You know, what fuck can I hear? And I found that on the back of the radio that my parents had had for years and years, there was a terminal that said antenna. And it had anything hooked to it. So I got some wire and hooked the wire to it and first just, you know, strung out some wire in the room and voila, the radio got better. And so eventually I moved the, the wire to the outside and it got even better. And back in those days with the old radios, I could hear Nicaragua, you know, at night, at home, on the old vacuum tube radios, and my friends didn't believe it, you know, nobody, they all thought I was giving them a line of BS when I would tell them what I could hear on the radio. But I got, it, you know, it got me, it got me interested in that. And then CB radio came along and I got interested in that. And, and, uh, would this be in the late 50s when the sun spots were activity? Yes, yes it was. Yeah. And uh, actually, this gentleman and I were studying electronics at that time. Yeah. And uh, I was repairing TVs in my dad's basement. I always had three or four TVs down there that I was working on. Entrepreneur. And to, to, uh, for an antenna, I just had a, a piece of wire. It was an unfinished basement. That was stapled to the, you know, to the, to the rafters, yeah. and and so I was tuning back. In, you you young guys don't know anything about this, but back in those days when you tuned the receivers, you actually switched LCs, uh, uh, tuned circuits on a drum, and I was messing around with one of them, and I got there was a channel three, a low low frequency station in our area and I was tuning around one of those and I got down into the six meter ham band and heard hams yeah. talking on a TV and that's what got me interested in ham radio but anyway it just it just went on down the line till I went through the CB phase and then got into the into ham radio once that I could get my 
coach teed up the five words a minute. Yeah. And uh, uh, I wouldn't have done that, but I, I got a job, a summer job, and the guy that I worked with was a ham, and he wouldn't leave me alone at lunchtime. You know, I couldn't eat my lunch because I had to, I had to practice code. Somebody, I remember, uh, somebody asking a sculptor one time, uh, a, a sculptor who, uh, who made works of art out of granite, uh, how you know? How do you do that? You know? How do you how do you take a big chunk of granite and turn it into this beautiful work of art? And he said, you know, he says the work of art is always in the granite, and I see it. You know, he says I can see the work of art in the granite, and all I do is chip away, you know, all that's not necessary for the work of art to be there. And I think all of us that have been hands for some length of time can see antennas inside of other materials. And if you're a new hand, like Paul, that will come to you because after a while, you'll, you'll, you, know, you will recognize what quarter what wavelengths uh, in, uh, in objects that conduct is with respect to the frequencies that we use, and you will see things that will be good, and you'll be able to recognize things that will be good antennas. And so to finally get to why I built this antenna, my wife broke her foot. And she, the doctor sent her home in a cast and said, you need to stop by the drugstore and buy a set of crutches. And so we did. We stopped by and a set of crutches cost Thirty or forty dollars or whatever it was, and we brought them home. And I noticed, you know, there was adjustments that I had to set up for, you know, for her. She's about my height, so we had to adjust them. And these crutches actually have some rough adjustments on the top. There's some uh, some adjustments up here that are five and six inches apart, and then down in this part they have. Uh, adjustments that are one inch apart. So if you, you know, if you take those adjustments and move them from one extreme to the other, the, the antenna, the crutches, actually can be, you know, pretty, pretty functional. And if you look at, plug that up to an antenna analyzer, you'll find that they can, they will resonate anywhere from just above 40 megahertz to something in the 70 some megahertz range if you if you fully collapse them. So I said we gotta get your foot healed up because <laughs> you know we you know what I need we, for 52 megahertz. We, we've got a, we've got a project. So you, I, you can't see it in this, but you know that crutches have on the bottom end they have this rubber piece of rubber on there so they don't skid and everything. So the first thing I did, the uh, first night she was home with the crutches, I pulled that off and went to the garage, and I found that I had some PVC pipe out there that the that this this end right here made a, a really close fit into. And so I says, man, here I'm on the way already. I've got the I, I've got the two elements, I've got insulators, but the piece of PVC. Uh, was only three quarter inch, and so <clears throat> that was pretty flimsy. You know, you think can't take three quarter inch PVC pipe and put it on the middle of this and extend these out to 110 or 112 inches, which you know is what six meter antennas usually are. And so I said, I, I need a little more beef to that, and so. <coughs> I went to the to Lowe's and I just started looking and I says, well, about inch and a half size uh, reducers will do a really good job for beefing it up a little bit. And so that's what what these are. These are three quarter inch to inch and a half reducers and a three quarter inch T here. And guys, it doesn't get a whole lot simpler than that to construct an antenna. Now, I didn't, you did need to make electrical connections, 
and you have to uh, make a connection with this piece of metal that's on the inside. Now, I don't know if all of the crutches are like this, but these crutches almost have like an I-beam material. This. There is a, a little divot. The, the material is not round. It has a little, a little, a little depression in it that you can see right, right here. And so that fit my purpose. I said, well, actually a, a nut for a number eight screw will fit down inside of, of this and still go inside that piece of PVC conduit. I already, I already had this uh, mast that I could fit in the, the hitch of my pickup truck that would get it about uh, 12 or 14 foot up off the ground. So I take it out in my driveway and uh, <clears throat> so what, did you, what did you put to insulate the two crutches in the, when they come into the center? I just didn't put them all the way together. Right, I, I slid them in. I slid them inside a piece of three-quarter inch conduit, and you know I just didn't bring the two pieces together. I just you know I just left them separated. Okay. I'm, if I remember, it might be three quarters or an inch, something like that, separation okay. in the middle. But uh, anyway, that's what the uh, that's what the plot looked like. So it's good up to uh, from fifty to. 52 and a half megahertz. It's very, you know, very broadband like you would expect a dipole to be. The antenna thinks that its conductor diameter is this. It mm -hmm. thinks that this is the conductor, mm -hmm. the conductor diameter. So, uh, you know, that does two things. It makes the antenna broader in, you know, in frequency response, but and it, it probably also gives the antenna a little bit more of what's known as, if we, ha if we have an antenna aficionado here, as a capture area. It may have just a little bit more capture area than, than an antenna strung from regular wire. But anyway, it's, that's an interesting... Is the aluminum crutch continuous all the way around the arm? No. As that's a matter of fact, it's insulator. not. This is like an insulator up okay. here. Okay. What about where the hand hand goes? No, those are insulators as well. Okay. And actually, I thought about taking these off, but they they do uh, give a little bit of stabilization to the antenna, sure. and uh, and I just I just left them on there. Well, that's that's the magic right there. <laughs> that's what, that's the reason people come wandering up saying, well, "What's that?" <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, these are getting to be ragged. I built this thing first built it in uh, 2015 and it's been you know out in the weather and you know it's been to a, a lot of the hilltopping and ham fest and, and stuff like that but anyway I, I told Paul here uh, he's Paul's relatively new in the hobby he's been a ham for a couple of years and uh, I told him dipole he says you know he's still learning stuff and I says well dipoles are the simplest antenna, you know, I don't know why anybody would want to come to this forum in the first place, but I learned something building this antenna. I've been ham for 50 years, and that's, you know, this business about the K. I never paid much attention to that whenever I was building antennas. I just, you know, got them close, and uh, uh, that was it. Can you pull it apart, take the uh, arm rests and all that off, and would it... Can you shorten it enough to make it work on two meters? Ah. With on just two meters? Two, nope. With the, just uh, the two well, on, on yeah. two meters, it, no, it, 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 two it, meters it, you need about 18 inches. 18 here. on a side, right? Yeah, yeah so it, actually, pro actually, this this piece is, is probably longer than it goes up to here. It's longer. So than, what if you cut that off? Could you still make sure. that work on six meters? Uh, Could you use six and two meters? Oh, uh, I don't think so. Wouldn't have enough length then for six. Yeah, no, I don't think there was. Uh, only well, I, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. You you may very well may be able to do that if you. No, no. Not and still have the whole crutch yeah. there. No. Well, no, it's the idea to make it multi-band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. No. no. You could. Uh, but you could probably cut. Cut these off, you know. Cut these off, and still have enough length that you can throw, you know, get rid of the top part of the crutches, and still have the 36-inch 
yeah. in a generic 36 inch dipole for two years. Yeah. You, you probably could do that. I don't know. I, that, uh, that's I've a, got, I've got that might be my next project. Yeah, well, for direction <laughs> finding for fox hunts, you know, that's what you need. Yeah. Multiple. Yeah. <laughs> so that's part of my question. <clears throat> do you know what the radiation pattern is? On the, where is most of the? Well, it's like it's just like a dipole. dipole. It's it's broad. The radiation is broadside, but it's broadside both ways. So you know, it's for you would you would you would need a, a reflector or a director on it in order to know you know where the fox was. You would know the fox was well, either this. Way or that way. We always put them on one side of a river. Yeah. So <laughs> then we know where he is. Yeah, and so we start at the river. That, <laughs> if you were to that staff, the ambiguity. <laughs> if you were to stack another set of crutches on either side, would that change your radiation pattern to one direction? Uh, no. Uh, dipole radiation is a dipole radiation. Well, uh, if you put if you put. I mean the exact same crutch. If, if you parallel. put if you put two crutches and you fed them with, uh, 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 it yes, yoggy. yes, it two element yoggy. yes, yes, it would become a, a two element yogi. But you would have to space them. You know, you correct them. One wavelength, you think, or a half wavelength? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, okay, I, 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 you done any I, I, almost, I would guess if we didn't have another antenna expert. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh, I'm, let's well, get. I'm not, not going to do that. Uh, if you would like to have a novel antenna, I, you know, I guarantee you, I have had this place, this thing around to uh, ham fest and, uh, and to public forums and you put a sign up that says it's an antenna made out of crutches and you will get a crowd around and uh, it's, it's good to, to start selling ham radio to young guys like this right here. So you start off with a program called the CW Skimmer, which can listen to a large amount of spectrum coming out of your radio, and it can automatically decode uh, Morse code signals, and it will automatically spot them to this website called the Reverse Beacon Network. And you can go sit on your smartphone right now and get kind of a picture of what the CW bands look like right now. And I said to myself, well, that's really cool. And they let you download all of this data. I bet you can see uh, space weather effects in these data sets. And sure enough, sure enough, I was able to. And I picked one particular solar flare. So there was an X-class solar flare um, back in May of 2013. That's when I was working on this. And I looked at the reverse beacon network 15 minutes before the solar flare occurred. And this is what the connections, CW connections spots that RBN spotted were for a 50 minute period before the flare. And then right after the flare, for the 15 minute period after the flare, look what happened. Everything just, you can really see it right in the ham radio data. And this is, I mean, we've known, as hams, we've known about, you know, blackouts for a long time, but now we have this really cool tool that the ham radio community has built um, for ham radio purposes. We're now able to see space weather effects in this and actually plot it. And I was able to get this published in the professional literature. Another thing we were able to do with it, a few years ago, 2017, there was a total solar eclipse that went across the US, and I bet many people here were either involved in the solar eclipse QSO party or went out to go see it. And so we planned, we said, well, the eclipse is kind of like uh, a temporary night, but things are a little bit different because the, the speed of shadow is going to be different than night. There's a number of differences, so this is important to look at scientifically, too. So, we were able to, in addition, we were able to use the ham radio community and ask, can we use HF ham radio communications to observe eclipse effects on the atmosphere? And can we use data model comparisons to better understand the ham radio data and constrain or calibrate the models? And, and so, so we created this solar eclipse QSO party, which was basically taking the idea of a regular ham radio contest, have it take place during the eclipse, and then use the data sources, the RBN, PSK Reporter, WhisperNet, and um, participants of ended mods and observations, see what, see if we can see how the eclipse is affecting the atmosphere. Really going along here. We had a lot of communications with path lengths between 1,000 to 2,000 uh, kilometers distance. And then, and then as the eclipse shadow came on, so about 45 minutes before the eclipse maximum, 20 meters started to shut down. And then 
it really dropped out, and then gradually afterward, propagation returned. Now, one of the ways we worked on modeling this is we took that same ray tracing code I showed you at the beginning, and we uh, did a simulation where we did an equally spaced grid of transmitters across the US and simulated what would it look like if, what would the computer predict if um, between each of those simulated points and each of the locations of the receivers. And you can see that the model actually turned out quite well. You mean the Air Force Museum? Air Force Museum and also uh, uh, radio. Oh, the VO in there? Absolutely. There's some good, good nerd stuff around Dayton, Ohio. But the Air Force Museum is one of them. I will also want to tell you, Contest University it was on a Thursday. Anybody been to Contest University? Oh man, are you missing out? How about you back there in that black hat? You ever been to Contest University? That's the guy that runs it. That's Mr. Tim Duffy. And uh, Tim, Tim had Tim and I and uh, well, his group, Contest University and Hamvention, have forged a really good uh, relationship. And Tim helps me with the uh, updates and videos, and, but, but that's all part of supporting each other. All right, any other comments about why you go there? I love this. Four days in May, just important. That's true. There's so many great events, and here's the important thing, www.hamvention.org. We keep it updated, lots of activities, and if you don't have a place to stay and you want a primo place to stay, and contact the Convention Visitors, visitors Bureau on that. Complimentary on the best bus service anywhere. You guys do it better than anybody else. And I'm almost tempted to give you a prize right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's expensive. But man, it works. Yeah. It, you know, I, I would say that, you know, it's, it's really, we don't make a lot of money on it, on Hamvention, and the money we do make we put a lot of it back into supporting amateur radio and that's part of our mission to do that you know yeah i don't get paid anything this guy's the only guy that gets paid I, <laughs> actually wait i didn't know that we pay he didn't let me finish we pay attention <laughs> We sunk a lot of money into that facility. We don't want to have to go through this ever again. I am very happy to say that we just signed a few months ago a five-year commitment with the fairgrounds to continue having our event there. They're very happy with us, and we are very happy with them. It's been a great relationship. You can buy J38 telegraph keys for 25 cents, five for a dollar, if you pick them out of a barrel. This was heaven. Heaven for a ham, I tell you, I had the best time you could ever imagine. You could buy a Norden bomb site, a Norden bomb site for five bucks and take it apart and play with the gears. What else do you do when you're 15 years old with a Norden bomb site, right? It was heaven. Um, really, really extraordinary. I took some video, some uh, eight millimeter movies of it. Uh, just before it got torn down for the World Trade Center, and I'll give a talk on Radio Row at some point, talk about those wonderful stores. A uh, little bit of time to kill, so I'll tell you a story or two. The, uh, the people who ran the stores on Radio Row were a really odd assortment. There was Mr. Leeds, who was my favorite character of all, big fat guy with a huge old cigar, and I'm not sure he ever changed that cigar. It was always clamped in his mouth, and he would go around grumping, grumping at people. And I actually saw him kick a couple of people out of his store. He just had no, no love for customers, even though he was depending on them. And I was a little kid at that point, 15, and I'd go in and I'd sort of poke around, and he'd put up with me, and he would get drunk. Uh, by the end of Friday, beginning of the weekend, he would be really, really drunk. And one time I waited until he got quite drunk, and uh, it was maybe an hour before closing time on Friday, and I said, uh, would you let me go upstairs and look in your, uh, in your warehouse up there? And he had five stories of stuff up there that no one ever saw. And that was one of the high points of my ham life, going up into those 
upper five stories. Now, in those days, when you bought surplus and you opened a surplus store, you didn't just um, you didn't just uh, buy one or two things, right, Van? You brought you bought a hundred things. And people on Radio Row had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things up in those uh, upper floors, and it was just absolutely fascinating to see those guys and to poke through it. So that was a lot of fun. The other thing that I did was G and G Electronics, another one of those Radio Row stores sold Gibson Girl uh, emergency transmitters, transmitted on 500 kc, and they sent SOS if you crank them. And they had hundreds and hundreds of those, but the best part was, up on their upper floors, they had boxes and boxes of balloons that you used to raise the antenna of these things. So if you're on a, on a lifeboat and you want to send out an SOS signal, you want to send up your antenna very, very high. And so these Gibson girls were, were equipped with a balloon and a hydrogen generator to fill the balloon. You took the hydrogen generator, you stuck it in the water, you put the balloon on top, and pretty soon you had a full balloon to carry your vertical antenna up. Well, I bought a couple of those, and then I had this brilliant idea. Hey, that's neat. He, he was selling the whole thing, balloon and hydrogen generator, for 50 cents a piece. So I bought five or ten of them, and I went to Central Park, and I filled them up in the, the, the lake in Central Park for water, you know, and I'm generating hydrogen, and these balloons are big. And I didn't send up an antenna with them. I thought... Here I am, 15 years old. I'm going to put a postcard on each of these balloons, and I'm going to just let them go and hope that somebody is going to send me a postcard. Well, of course, nobody ever. I mean, 10 balloons, how can you miss? Nobody ever sent me a postcard. Another story from those days, um, the BC-611 walkie-talkies that John Wayne always used on top of a mountain, talking from one mountain to another. I thought, boy, these are great. You get two for five bucks with the batteries. And so another ham and I bought these things, and we went out in Central Park, and we measured how far apart we could get. We got two football fields before the, the signal died out. So forget John Wayne. I later found out, 20 years later, that they had purposely detuned the receivers, the, the transmitter of a BC-611 because they didn't want the GIs in the field to be able to be picked up by the Germans so they could listen in on them and that stuff like that. So, you know, a lot of fun, really a lot of fun in growing up in New York City. My last story, another ham on the other side of Central Park, and I like to communicate by flashing light signals at each other. Well, the population of New York City seeing Morse code light signals from one building to another. They called the police, the police called the FBI. Pretty soon we had the FBI and the police in our apartment uh, asking my parents, what is going on with this kid? And it took a little bit of explaining. All the fun and games of growing up ham uh, in New York City in those days.